Hello and welcome to the third lecture in the Gastroenterology and Hepatology uh, talks for the MRCP. I'm Jason Jennings, I'm a consultant gastroenterologist uh, in Leeds and in this lecture we'll be focusing on the liver and uh, hepatology. So if we just go straight into the first question, um, a 26 year old male IVDU presents with a five month history of lethargy. Examination is unhelpful Liver enzymes reveal raised transaminases. He has hyperbilirubinemia and a high alkaline phosphatase. Chronic hepatitis C is the most likely diagnosis because which of these ends that sentence in the most effective way? Well, the answer is clearly E. He's a 26 year old male, he's an IVDU he's likely to have developed hepatitis C because he shared ne needles. Question two, along a similar theme. You're asked to see a 26 year old nurse who suffered a needle stick injury about eight months ago. She didn't go immediately to occupational health but went to see her GP later on because she started to feel unwell, tired and lethargic. She has raised ALT anti-HBS antibodies and anti-HCV antibodies. She has low levels of hep C RNA. She's had a liver biopsy um, and this is shown early inflammatory change. What diagnosis fits best with this clinical picture? So, are you going to go for it's all in your mind, don't worry about it? Um, autoimmune hepatitis or one of the viral things? Well I think from the history clearly she's got viral antibodies. And the clue here is something to think about. She's a nurse. She's likely to have been vaccinated for hepatitis B and that explains why she has anti-HBS antibodies. Everything else points towards hepatitis C. And the fact that she has RNA in her blood which is detected by PCR, suggests she has active hepatitis C virus present. So let's talk about the hepatitis viruses. Um, hepatitis A doesn't come up so much in the exam, but to cover it fairly quickly, it's an RNA virus, there's only one serotype, and it's spread by the fecal-oral route, so via poor hygiene methods. It replicates in your liver, and it's shed in the faeces for two weeks before you get symptoms. By the time a patient is jaundiced, they, their contacts have already been exposed. So having shed it, the patients become jaundiced, initially with a hepatitic picture, by, we, by which I mean a raised ALT and a raised uh, AST, if you measure it in your lab, followed by cholestasis, so raised bilirubin and a raised alkaline phosphatase or gamma GT. Often there are symptoms of systemic upset, such as nausea or anorexia. And you diagnose it on a blood test by performing a HEPA IgM based antibody test. For most people, it's, a, it's an illness that passes without any problems. Um, very, very rarely does it cause fulminant liver failure and a risk of death. Most patients recover with no long-term sequelae. Other rare complications include rash, vasculitis, myocarditis and renal failure, sort of things that viruses can do in rare circumstances. Um, for a long time we just gave patients passive immunoglobulin before they went on holiday but now there is a vaccine. Hepatitis B <coughs> is a DNA virus. And there are a number of serotypes, and there is a classification, but you won't be asked about that. It's spread um, sexually, vertically, i.e. mother to child, and via the blood. And there is an incubation period of one to five months. It's estimated that the chronic carriage rate in the UK is about one in 200, whereas in Africa and Asia, it's one in 10 or more. There are a number of things to remember before we try and think about what we measure. Surface antigen is exactly that. It's a protein 
based on the outer core, the outer envelope of the uh, viral particle. E antigen is from the inner part of the virus and is only seen when there is active replication. C antigen or core, an or core antigen also has a role in replication but isn't measured. And the damage to the liver is caused by the body's immune response. When it comes to the exam, these are the sort of things to try and remember. If you've got surface antigen, you're chronically infected. If you've got surface antibody, you're immune, either via infection or via vaccination. If you've got E antigen, you're very infectious and are at high risk of getting liver disease. If you have E antibody, you're seroconverting. Um, there is a way to distinguish between immunisation and past infection of hepatitis B, and that's by measuring the core antibody, the C antibody, but that's very rarely done, unless you're trying to answer that specific question. Today, we also measure the hepatitis DNA viral load, which is another marker of active replication. And when you're looking at the treatment options for hepatitis B, we actually measure S antigen, E antigen, ALT and viral load. And those four factors are used to determine who gets treated and what treatment they get. And the treatment really is highly complicated now and you shouldn't be asked about it other than the principles. And the principal drugs that are currently used are interferon, lamivudine, adefavir and entecavir. The majority of those interfere with DNA replication of the virus. As you can see, once you get an infection with hepatitis B, 5 to 10% become chronic carriers. And if you're a chronic carrier with the E antigen, then you're at high risk of chronic liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma or hepatoma. Hepatitis C is similar but different. It's an RNA virus and it's spread mainly via blood contact. Sexual spread is less common. Um, the different, one of the main differences with the hepatitis B is that instead of a small percentage becoming chronic carriers, a high percentage become chronic carriers. And it tends to cause slowly progressive liver disease. So maybe a third of patients will become cirrhotic within 10 years. And a third of those can develop a hepatoma. The testing is based on an IgG antibody, which remain positive for life, so you can't distinguish between current or past infection. The way to determine if you're currently infectious and currently at risk of liver disease is by doing the PCR. <coughs> there are six genotypes, and the treatment is currently based on a combination therapy of interferon with ribavirin. On the length of duration of treatment, um, very much depends on the genotype. Genotypes 1 and 4 have the poorest response, 2 and 3 have the higher responses, and consequently 2 and 3 get less uh, duration of treatment. And in fact, many patients now would be treated for 2 or 3 without having a liver biopsy first. So, let's move on. A 42-year-old woman is referred to the liver clinic by her GP. She has a raised ALT at 160. Her past history of note includes diabetes and obesity. She had cholecystitis two years ago. What diagnosis best fits this picture? And we have a choice of five things again. Autoimmune, PBC, gallstones, cirrhosis, and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. In the UK, there are three growth areas for hepatology, um, and nothing about them is particularly glamorous. Alcohol, fatty liver disease, and hepatitis C. And this woman has got some characteristics from her history that suggest she has fatty liver disease. She has the raised ALT, and she has the metabolic syndrome risk factors. She's overweight, and she's had a previous episode of diabetes. Um, 
gallstones wouldn't give you a raised ALT, it's generally raised arc fos and raised bilirubin. Cirrhosis, well, you can't say that based on her history. Uh, PBC, again, it's generally the ALP, gamma GT, that goes up. Autoimmune is, a, is the other uh, possibility, but with the risk factors, you'd go down the fatty liver route first. The whole group of conditions is now called NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And it's a combination of two entities, simple steatosis, and you'll see on the figure the clear spaces on the liver biopsies indicate fat droplets. Simple steatosis on the left, and NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, on the right. Steatosis is just a fatty liver. In NASH, the fat leads to an inflammatory process which damages the liver in a very similar way to alcohol. So why is ASH not a ASH? Well, the only way you can reliably tell whether someone has alcoholic steatohepatitis or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is by asking them if they drink. So clearly there are some uh, problems with that. And these probably aren't two completely separate entities. Nine out of ten people will have simple steatosis one out of ten will have NASH, but it very much depends on which part of the liver you're sampling when you do a liver biopsy, and a lot of people will probably have a bit of both. And you can think of fatty liver disease as the liver equivalent of all these other problems. Obesity, hypertension, diabetes, lipid problems which are sometimes called the metabolic syndrome, and the WHO have a definition for each of these things. Homer Simpson is clearly suffering from fatty liver disease. He's yellow, for one. But uh, on a serious note, he has the, the, waist hip, the high weight waist hip ratio, the beer belly, and that places people at more increased risk of um, fatty liver disease. So the distribution of the fat is important. Um, and 40 to 100% of people with fatty liver disease are overweight. Um, and uh, there are some factors there showing the prevalence in obesity. How do we treat it? Well, basically, we optimize the cofactors. Get the blood pressure right, get the cholesterol right, get the diabetes right, lose weight. And weight loss can actually improve the liver biopsy appearances. A number of drugs have been trialled. There is some promise with the glitazone class, the metformin class, and the Orlistat class. And this includes giving these drugs to patients who aren't diabetic. But the majority of uh, hepatologists only go as far as the top three because the drug therapies are not proven. Question four. A 45-year-old man with a history of alcoholic cirrhosis comes to A&E with torrential upper GI bleeding. You suspect he may have varices. Which of the following best fits with the clinical features of varices? Just read through those. I'll give you a moment, and then we'll go on to the answer. So the answer here is the overall mortality from a single episode of variceal bleeding is about 30%. That's every time they come in. Um, we'll deal with each of these other points as I go through the explanation. Um, this figure just shows what can actually happen with patients with a variceal bleed. You'll see the top left-hand side shows a spurting esophageal varix. Um, the middle figure on the top shows a gastric varix, the Sinstarkin tube, the Sinstarkin tube in situ, and what the endoscopic appearance looks like with the banding device on the end of the endoscope, much limited view. The middle slide on the bottom shows portal gastropathy. 50% of people with alcoholic cirrhosis get varices within two years, um, and that obviously gets higher by 10 years. 30% with large varices bleed in their first year, and 70% who survive the first bleed have another bleeding episode within six months. And as we've said, variceal bleeding kills 30% of cirrhotics with portal hypertension. 
with each bleed having a 30 to perhaps 50% mortality. What are the risk factors for your first bleed? Well, the bigger the varices, for obvious reasons, there are certain endoscopic signs such as cherry red spots, which basically look like the varix vein with some red spots on them. Worsening child pew classification or any other of the classifications for prognosis of liver disease. The worse it is, the worse your score is, the more likely you are to bleed. That's common sense. And if you're drinking, if you're an alcoholic, alcohol consumption puts the pressure up in your portal vein directly. Reflux esophagitis, acid problems, doesn't seem to have anything to do with it. So the principles of management are to lower the portal pressures and to reduce the blood flow. Glypressin, terlipressin, controls the hemorrhage in 60 to 80 percent. And endoscopic therapy controls in about 80 percent. And sclerotherapy or banding are about equivalent. Um, sclerotherapy isn't used as much as banding because it has a higher complication rate of causing ulceration in the esophagus. If you use drugs with endoscopic, th endoscopic therapy, you get an increased benefit of using either in isolation. But as you can see, terlipressin by itself is an effective treatment. What about treatment failures? Well, there are perhaps four options. You could do a, a radiological shunt called a TIPS, which is generally done in specialist centres. They work very well, but they're best reserved for patients with good liver synthetic function, so people in child's Pew score A, perhaps. Um, they can be used as a bridge to transplant, um, but there are major complications such as encephalopathy because you've bypassed the liver or uh, right-sided heart failure because, again, the blood is going directly from the portal vein into the hepatic vein or IVC. Surgical shunts are very rarely used because of the complications. Esophageal transection is never used because of the complications. And in some, it may be an indication for transplant. Um, there isn't much evidence for giving primary prevention, i.e. endoscopic therapy or propanolol, before the varices bleed. But there is very good evidence for doing endoscopic therapy or propanolol following uh, a variceal hemorrhage to try and prevent the risk of further hemorrhage. Um, obviously, in alcoholics, compliance is a big issue. Um, nitrates can be used as an alternative to propanolol as a drug therapy, but the evidence suggests they don't actually work. Next question. <clears throat> you may have come across this in um, clinical practice. A 17-year-old girl comes to A&E, she's, she's had a row, and she's taken 40 paracetamol tablets about 24 hours ago. So, in hepatology terms, it's a late presentation of a pod or a paracetamol overdose. Which of the following markers is the best indicator of prognosis? Well, the answer is prothrombin time, and I expect most of you will have got that. But this is all based on the King's criteria, um, the King's uh, liver unit in London, and they did a retrospective analysis of a paracetamol overdose pod um, many years ago now, big numbers, and showed that there was less than 10% survival for patients who met certain criteria without a liver transplant, OLT. Uh, for paracetamol, a pH less than 7.3, despite good adequate fluid resuscitation, or a prothrombin time over 100 seconds and a creatinine and severe encephalopathy. You don't have to have those bottom three at the same time. They can be during uh, a, a time, an evolving time period. As a general rule of thumb, if your prothrombin time is more than 30 seconds at 30 hours, you're going to run into trouble. And we often recommend that patients have their prothrombin time measured uh, every eight hours if it's, a, if it's a proper overdose. You review a 21-year-old woman who presents to her GP with abnormal LFTs. On examination, she has a tremor. The GP arranges a screen for causes of chronic liver disease. Which one of these is suggestive of Wilson's disease? <laughs>
The answer is A, decreased serum seroplasmin. We'll just have a little talk about Wilson's disease. So it's sometimes called hepatolenticular de degeneration, but no one can ever remember how to spell that. Um, we do now know that the gene is found in chromosome 13, and it's a copper transporter. So it kind of makes sense. And the problem is that there is a failure to excrete copper via the bile ducts within the liver. So the serum copper and the serum seroplasmin are low. The urine copper goes up in a kind of compensation mechanism. Um, so we measure serum copper, we measure serum seroplasmin, and we measure 24-hour urinary copper. And by the time patients have neurological abnormalities, they have significant liver abnormalities. And these are usually movement-related, but dementia can occur. Very rarely, Wilson's disease can cause acute fulminant liver failure. More typically, it causes a chronic progressive liver problem. Everybody knows about the case of Fleischer rings, but don't bother looking for them because you can only see them with a slit lamp. So if you think someone has got Wilson's disease, you get the ophthalmologist to look in their eyes using a slit lamp. And for the purpose of the exam, hemolysis is a rare complication. The next question. Again, a common scenario that you'll have seen. <coughs> Friends bring a 29-year-old man to casualty. He is incoherent. They tell you he's not been himself all day. His case notes show that he's hep C positive, IV drug user, and an alcoholic. He's yellow, he's got stigmata of chronic liver disease. You can't feel his liver, but his spleen is enlarged, and he has a small amount of ascites. What would be your first investigation? <coughs> Once again, this is a question where all of the answers are potentially right, but what would be the first thing you would do? So the concern here is that he may be encephalopathic. And you would do a CT head to look for subdurals or some other intracerebral pathology. <clears throat> you would measure his electrolytes, and the sodium may well be low, especially if he's actively drinking. You may do a blood alcohol level. There isn't a huge point if his friends say he's been drinking, but some people like to have evidence. You would certainly sample his acidic fluid looking for SBP, but in the question, it has a small amount of ascites. Um, one of the reversible causes of encephalopathy is hypoglycemia, and of course one of the functions of the liver is um, to make glucose and to store glycogen and uh, to regulate your blood glucose level. So your first investigation, hopefully in A&E or by the paramedics, would be to do a BM. This is a similar question. An alcoholic patient with chronic liver disease presents with ascites, peripheral edema, and a raised temperature. The diagnostic tap shows neutrophilia. What would be your first line of management? And we have some choices here again. Antibiotics, a acidic drain, a uh, shunt, some diuretics, or fluid restriction and salt restriction. So all of those are potential treatments in this situation but what would be your first line management? Well, hopefully you've realised that he's got SPP. Um, and yes, you might restrict his fluids and his salt to deal with his societies. You may give him spironolactone. Um, you probably wouldn't do a shunt because you've not done the other things yet. You may do a drain, but in patients with SPP, um, the fluid often re reaccumulates very rapidly. Um, and also they're at quite high risk of developing hepatorenal syndrome and just sepsis. So early intravenous antibiotics are quite important. An SPP is the infection of acidic fluid in the absence of a surgically treatable or other cause of peritonitis. And it occurs in the setting of patients with pre-existing liver disease. The incidence is said to be 70 to 30 percent per year and Early diagnosis and prompt treatment reduces mortality from 90% to under 20%. The risk factors include a prior episode, 
two-thirds develop a recurrence with a year, within a year, and that's the rationale for why we sometimes give people antibiotic prophylaxis. GI bleeding can precipitate it, which is why um, if you've had a variceal hemorrhage, most trusts policy would be to use uh, antibiotic prophylaxis following a variceal bleed. The less the amount of protein there is in the fluid, an increasing severity of prognostic scores. You can only diagnose it by examining the acidic fluid and a acidic neutrophil count of greater than 250 cubic millimetre or 0.25 times 10 to the 9 per litre. Usually caused by coliforms, mainly E. coli. And you can increase your yield by putting some acidic fluid into blood culture bottles. Um, we tend to use broad spectrum antibiotics and current guidelines suggest cephalosporins. In, in my trust we use tazacin. There's also some evidence that plasma expanders, or at least trying to maintain an adequate circulating volume, improves prognosis, because hepatorenal failure is a significant risk. As I say, people should consider for long-term prophylaxis, and at current that is a quinolone, such as ciprofloxacin, and it's a relative indication for liver transplant. Question nine. A 48-year-old man presents with a family history of hemochromatosis. And he's concerned about his risk and wanting some advice. He's had some blood tests which have shown this ferritin is high and he's got a low iron binding capacity. What would you do next to try and give him that advice? And we have a choice of five things. DNA analysis, desferioximin, liver biopsy, venosection, and regular serum ferritins. Well, in this situation, you've got a family history of hemochromatosis, you've got abnormal blood tests with abnormal ferritin, you've done a second line iron study, the iron binding capacity. So the way we tend to diagnose hemochromatosis now is by doing a DNA analysis. Um, there isn't much point in repeating the ferritin, we know it's high. We haven't made a diagnosis, so you can't really start the treatment. Liver biopsy used to be done before we had the DNA test. These days, we tend to do the liver biopsy to establish whether the patients have cirrhosis or not. If they do, they then can enter the hepatoma surveillance programs. Um, we tend not to do liver biopsies to work out the iron index anymore. Desferioxamine is an iron collating agent. It's the sort of thing that uh, you need special permission to prescribe for patients, so you wouldn't do that. Um, DNA analysis. So, hemochromatosis is the most commonly inherited single gene defect in Northern Europeans. We know it's on chromosome 6P, which is where the HLA locus is, and it's autosomal recessive with variable expression. The main gene abnormality that is tested for is the C282I mutation. The other one that can be tested for is H63D, but if you have that in an isolation, it probably doesn't mean uh, all that much. And Less than 5% of patients without uh, the C282Y mutation will have hemochromatosis, so it's quite a good one to test for. And as you know, there's increased intestinal absorption of iron, resulting in deposition in other organs. Men are affected more early in life than women because women are relatively protected from having menstruation. Um, symptoms include tiredness, arthralgia with chondrocalcinosis, slaty grey skin, diabetes, testicular atrophy, liver disease and cardiomyopathy. And the blood test may show abnormal LFTs, a high ferritin, a low iron, a high, um, iron, um, high iron, iron binding saturation with low capacity to, to absorb any more. Um, and from that point we go on to perform the, the DNA test. There are a couple of tricks about raised ferritin, and you'll always get brainy points if you remember these. Ferritin is an acute phase protein, so it goes up with inflammation. It also goes up in alcoholics, <coughs> something to do with the alcohol stimulating production. The other disease where you get a high ferritin is adult stills disease. And the liver biopsy, as I say, its main role now is to establish cirrhosis. Um, treatment is by venosection, 
and cardiac failure may improve, arthropathy and diabetes generally don't. The next question, question 10. A 34-year-old woman with a history of diabetes comes to clinic with tiredness, mild abdominal discomfort and itching. The GP has done some tests prior to her clinic visit. And these tests, what do they show? Well, she's got a raised HbA1c, um, renal function is normal, fulbo count looks pretty normal too. We haven't got any LFTs, but we know that her smooth muscle antibody is positive and her immunoglobulins are raised. Which one of the following will be the next appropriate investigation? An ultrasound, some LFTs, uh, creatinine kinase, synaxin test, or TFTs. So, LFTs. I kind of gave it away with my preamble before. Um, so, this lady has got tiredness, positive smooth muscle antibody, positive immunoglobulins. So, you might be thinking about liver disease, you might be thinking about autoimmune hepatitis. There are different types. And I'm not going to go into this in any detail, but basically type 1 and type 2, which have different antibody profiles, you won't be asked about this. But in simple terms, type 1 and type 2, the type 2 one is why we now test for LKM antibodies, which you'll have seen on the immunology when you've asked for liver autoantibodies. It's a, it's, a, it's a variant which is pretty rare, it's quite common in women, and it presents in a very aggressive very damaged liver very early on with poor response to treatment. Type 1 is the more traditional autoimmune hepatitis you'll be familiar with. More common in women, can occur at any age with a positive smooth muscle antibody, the positive ANA. Um, and will respond to steroids and azathioprine for the majority of patients. As a general rule of thumb when it comes to liver disease, Immunoglobulin A is raised in alcohol, A for alcohol. Immunoglobulin G is raised in autoimmune, G for autoimmune, I think that's reasonable. And IgM is raised in PBC. So you can get a clue from um, the immunoglobulin sometimes. Again, uh, there are some features on the liver biopsy which might give you a clue when it comes to working out a diagnosis from a question point of view. If you see a liver biopsy that says plasma cells, autoimmune. If you see a liver biopsy that says granulomata or lymphocytes around the bile ducts with ductopenia, PBC. If you see fibrous obliterative cholangitis or ductopenia, PSC. Viral um, steatosis with uh, gran glass hepatocytes and uh, interface hepatitis. Drugs are nonspecific. Wilson's, you won't be asked that. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, you actually see the globules of the alpha-1 antitrypsin which can't leave the liver. So these things might come up in the question as a, to give you a clue as to what the diagnosis might be. Um, general rules with autoimmune hepatitis, well, if you're cirrhotic, quite a high death rate by five years. But steroids work well in a large proportion of patients and tend to work well if given in conjunction with azathioprine with quite a high relapse rate if you withdraw treatment. Okay, question 11. A 62-year-old man presents with jaundice to his GP. He has itching and weight loss over the past six months. On questioning, he admits a vague abdominal pain. He drinks a little bit, not very... Uh, much compared to some of the patients, but 12 units per day. Other history of note includes smoking um, in the past, and he gets intermittent diarrhoea. An examination, not a lot to find, although he is yellow, and he has some vague right upper quadrant tenderness. So itching, lethargy, weight loss, jaundice, abdominal pain, diarrhoea, drinks a bit. His blood tests show um, a raised ALT, possibly a raised alkaline phosphatase, depends on the, the reference range in the lab, 
but his ultrasound shows biliary dilatation. What would be the next most appropriate investigation? MRCP, ERCP, liver biopsy, some blood tests, or do some fancy genotyping with alpha-1 antitrypsin. Well, effectively you've got a chap with abnormal LFTs, some abdominal pain, and biliary dilatation on ultrasound. So you probably want some more information about his bile ducts, so you'd go for an MRCP. Um, ERCP really is now a therapeutic tool and shouldn't be used for diagnostic purposes. Um, and I think you can argue against liver biopsy and autoimmune profile because you know there's a problem with the bile ducts, so you want to take it to the next step, looking for a gallstone or a stricture, perhaps. So, coming towards the end of this talk, let's just go through some general points about LFTs. You should think about the liver as two separate organs. ALT and AST are your hepatocytes, and if they're raised, they imply inflammation of the hepatocytes with the risk of liver cell necrosis and death. ALP and gamma GT are the bile ducts. Abnormalities of them imply cholestasis, which could be due to obstruction or cholestasis within the liver. But remember, you also get alkaline phosphatase from your bone and from your placenta and perhaps a bit from the gut as well. Conjugated bilirubin suggests liver disease. Unconjugated bilirubin suggests hemolysis or a pre-liver problem. So if you have a patient with abnormal LFTs, go through the history, assess their alcohol consumption, talk about foreign travel, talk about treatments they may have had, IVDU, sexual activity, herbal remedies, you will be looking for signs of chronic liver disease and ascites. And it's quite important to realise that ascites, outside of alcoholics, is a sign of very compromised liver function. If you've got hepatitis B due to giving you ascites, then your liver is very badly damaged. In alcoholics, there is a potential for recovery if they stop drinking. So there may be some reversibility, but it's still a sign of very compromised liver function. Remember the clotting. It's one of the main synthetic markers of liver function. We're all familiar with the liver screen. If the ALT is in the thousands, then to me that suggests viruses, drugs and ischemia or congestion. There are rarer causes such as severe autoimmune hepatitis or Wilson's disease, but they're the ones that go through your mind. Viruses, drugs, including paracetamol, and um, ischemia or congestion. If you see a raised alkaline phosphatase, history. Itching is the one that might suggest cholestasis. Is there weight loss because of cancer or biliary obstruction? Are there any drugs that might cause cholestasis? Anything to suggest bone disease? So you could do their, their isoenzymes or the gamma GT to help you. You'll do the usual blood test, but you'll focus on autoantibodies, immunoglobulins, and the bile ducts. This man um, probably has primary sclerosis and cholangitis. He has some diarrhea, which suggests there may be some IBD going on. He has dilated bile ducts. Um, and enough about the history to suggest it as a possible diagnosis. And this can cause damage to the bile ducts within or outside the liver with fibrosis and scarring. 70% of patients are men, 90% of IBD, although only a small proportion of patients with IBD have PSC. ANA is positive, SMA may be positive, but the main marker of PSC is the P anchor. <coughs> there are HLA associations, but the main risks of PSC are the risks of cholangiocarcinoma, or cancer of the bile ducts, and colon carcinoma. So if you have a patient with PSC, you always do a colonoscopy to look for UC or Crohn's, even if they don't have any symptoms of diarrhea. Um, if they do have IBD, then they have annual colonoscopies to survey them because they're at such high risk. PSC is very different to PBC, which is a destruction of the bile ducts within the liver, 
very much more common in women. Often there's just a high alkaline phosphatase and it's diagnosed by doing the anti-mitochondrial antibody. 98% plus of them have the M2 subtype of AMA. They may also have the raised IgM and a liver biopsy will show ductopenia and maybe granulomas around the bile ducts. You can treat them using ursodeoxycholic acid and there are criteria at which point they reach a transplant. <clears throat> Patients with PSC and PBC often get varices earlier than the intrinsic liver diseases, such as autoimmune or viral hepatitis. Well, I think that completes the third lecture, um, the end of the hepatology lecture. Um, thank you very much for listening.